think we're all enjoying it. And um, I thank Keith, who's now walked off, for um, um, dropping me in this. Um, he phoned me up last week and said, um, I hear you do lunch. Well, I've got one for you. Uh, little did I know I was going to have to start singing for it, and here I am singing. Um, I joined IBM over 10 years ago, uh, primarily uh, to spearhead their marketplace into video, and video post-production, TV production. And I got into CCTV by a little bit of an accident when um, uh, somebody from Synaptics phoned me up and wanted to buy 500 discs. I said, what do you want to buy those for? And we ended up putting in the first IP, IT solution in this country back in 2001, 2002, up in Manchester. Uh, then the industry turned on us, and we didn't really do a lot. And I lost interest uh, because uh, the idea of interoperability, the idea of an IT company fighting the uh, move from video to DVRs was just too big a push. The industry didn't want to know. They were too busy trying to sell their own piece of hardware and software integrated, and uh, the idea of Big Blue or any other IT company getting involved with no interest. I read the Times last week um, that obviously fairly apropos when the Apollo um, moon uh, landings and mission was set up by JFK. Obviously he had a, a lot of reasons for doing that, but one I didn't realize was it was very much about the power of inspiration. He saw going for the moon was about how do you inspire people to do more. And it was just not just the moon, we got a lot of things out of that, but he was trying to get and kickstart the American economy. Now I'm not saying that IBM's command and control and chiefs runoff um, is something that we could uh, uh, align to the Apollo uh, space mission, but it was trying to use something different and look at it differently. When I spoke to Tom Williamson, I'm sorry he, he wasn't here to do this, but he unfortunately is not at all well. But he's a traditional security manager, uh, Red Cap, ex Red Cap, been an IBM security for 20 odd years. And I, I wouldn't say hoodwinked him, but I convinced him that there was maybe a different way of putting security systems together rather than buying on the cheapest tender, as we've heard talked about today. And he said, well, what do you mean, Rod? So we discussed it, and we talked about it. And he, he, he sort of opened up, and he said, I never want to be in a position where I have to go to the hospital and see a guard who's been smacked over the head with an iron bar, and we could see it on the CTTV. The guy was around the corner but we have no way of doing anything about it. Can you do anything about that? And I said, well, yes. And I said, at this stage, I'd run into a gruff old individual called Keith um, Bloodworth. And he'd explain what he was doing. And I thought, it was a damn good idea. And I was going to see if I could get IBM to buy into this. Uh, so, apart from the fact that I got notes from James to make sure that I talked about the exhaustive testing going around the world about what command and control system I was going to use, I'm afraid Keith was already there because I liked what he was saying. Why did IBM buy the system? Well, financially. It had to pay for itself in 18 months and it had to supply year on year cost savings of at least 8% of our security budget year on year. We were able to do that and more. Now, we have, we've been talking about man guarding down this end of the table. Now, man guarding to us is that we have 26 locations working from manufacturing to highly secure environments where uh, there are no IBM logos on the outside of that building. And therefore, we have lots of different security requirements. When we started talking to the 100 and, no, it was 243 guards that we employed uh, uh, on a, an hourly basis, we would see this reduced dramatically because 
by building a command and control room, uh, we were able to start demanding buildings when they weren't being very used. Now, obviously you have vice presidents who have quite a lot of ego, and they said this is impossible. You know, how can you possibly close this building? I need to get into it. We're quite happy for you and quite happy to supply those guards for you to get into it, but that's going to come off your budget. They then capitulated and accepted that with now modern methods, we can work from home and therefore we can start dictating what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Now, based on the fact that IBM has some very strict policies and some very strict budget guidelines, we also get the, the, the fact that we have Armonk, which is our head office, which also comes back and tells us what the new risk is this week and what the new problem is going to be next month. And of course, we don't get any more budget to do anything about that. So suddenly, you're getting a continual feed of problems that you've got to solve with a diminishing budget. And the fact that the really the only way you can reduce your budget is by reducing man guarding. Of the 243 guards that we, and ladies and men we asked to come and start manning our command room in southern England, as we said it, <laughs> um, only three people wanted to be involved. That's stunning when you think about what we actually built and what we've been discussing down here is the fact that if you're paying bottom dollar, you get people that move on quite quickly. If you are paying top dollar and uh, Tom is trying to look at how he can pay £15.50 an hour for people because what he now sees in the system that's been installed at IBM is the fact that we can start bringing in other elements that we hadn't envisaged before. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, I was down uh, in the operational centre and chatting away to the head of uh, the operation. And there were two guys in the corner chatting away to themselves and you know, generally keeping out of the way. And I said, well, what are those two guys? And they said, oh, they're in charge of the alarms in the executive cars. Oh, I said, that's a fantastic idea. So you're bringing that back into the command room so that when an executive or a chauffeur is in trouble, he hits the panic button, it immediately comes up onto the big barco wall and you can see where the car is. You can then get in front with the police and guide the two together. He said, no. I said, but, but surely if they're here in the command room. He said, no, they're just installing a telephone. So when that rings, the chauffeur's in trouble. <laughs> I said, um, can we go and talk to them? So we talked to them and I said to Keith, is this possible? He said, if it's in whatever language and I don't know what database it was, he said, if it's in like that, yes, we can communicate. Suddenly, it, all lights went on. And that's what we started to see with the members of staff that are running down there, is they're starting to look at ways of innovating. 